Hello, everyone. I'm Becca, dietitian by trade, mom 24-7, wife from the start, and when there's a few extra hours in the day, you might find me hitting the trails or on horseback. And I'm Kara, a therapist to women, a mom to a boy, an entrepreneur, mountain junkie, and a postpartum runner. And this is Fit for a Queen, a podcast that's devoted to the female athlete wanting to balance the teeter-totter of all the things we desire out of life as women. Performance, health, intellect, and taking time for self, even if we only get one minute out of the day. We're so excited to be bringing you the queens in the athletic world who have done just that. Okay, ladies, take a seat at your thrones, grab your crowns, and welcome to Fit for a Queen. Hello, queens. We are beyond excited for today's guest, Katherine Schweitzer. So we have to read her bio through and through because she has done so much for the world of sports and women. Um, It started with the Boston Marathon. So just this weekend, she ran the New York Marathon. And how cool was that to be there to see Shalane Flanagan um, win? I think the last 40 years was the last time an American woman has won that race. Mm -hmm. Six months ago at the Boston Marathon, the world was pleasantly startled to learn that a 70-year-old woman ran a marathon 50 years after she ran her first one. She was the first woman to ever do that, and she did it convincingly. In fact, 24 minutes slower than she did her first marathon at age 20 and could still run circles around me. (laughs) In so doing, Catherine Schweitzer broke yet another barrier in a lifetime of breaking barriers and simultaneously celebrated 50 years of women athletic and social achievements. She's our guest speaker on here today and Catherine Schweitzer is many a thing. She's an athlete. She's an author. And Catherine, I don't know if you remember this, but you came in for the Girls on the Run luncheon and Kara and I were actually there and met you and you signed our books. Um, So it's really exciting that this has come full circle. Um, Yes, I do remember and how exciting it was to be there. I love that day. I remember actually getting in at the crack of dawn. I was so worried (laughs) about a late flight and it all worked out fine. Yeah, that was such a great luncheon and so inspiring. She earned her bachelor's in journalism and English as well as her master's from Syracuse University, but she will always be best known as the woman who, in 1967, challenged the all-male tradition of the Boston Marathon and became the first woman to officially enter and run the event. Her entry garnered worldwide attention when a race official tried to forcibly remove her from the competition, and this was captured in a photo that became one of Time Life's 100 photos that changed the world. Catherine's run 40 marathons, won the 1974 New York City Marathon, and in 1975, her two-hour and 51-minute marathon in Boston was ranked sixth in the world and third in the U.S. She's been a runner for 58 years. Having been denied many athletic opportunities herself, Catherine became a tireless advocate for female athletes, and after organizing a global series of 400 women's races in 27 countries, she was instrumental in making the Women's Marathon an official event in the Olympic Games, first staged in 1984 in Los Angeles. She has advocated for women's sports participation throughout the world and continues today with the creation of 261 Fearless, a global nonprofit movement that empowers women through running. She has won several Emmys for sports commentary. She has authored hundreds of articles and three books and is frequently interviewed about her marathon experience and her focus on female athlete advocacy. She's earned more awards than I can name, but a few highlights are being named Runner of the Decade and one of four Visionaries of the Century by Runner's World Magazine and an Honor Fellow from the National Association of Girls and Women in Sports. Similarly, she was in several halls of fame, but none more important than the National Women's Hall of Fame, where she was inducted not so much for her own running, but for changing millions of women's lives through running. When Catherine won the New York City Marathon in 1974, the event was held entirely within Central Park, but she has never actually run through the five boroughs of the city. Her 28 times the streets of the marathon were as a commentator on the back of a TV (laughs) motorcycle. Welcome, Catherine, to the podcast. Thanks so much for being on. Wow, what a, what a long, wonderful introduction. And, <laughs> and, of course, we have to amend the change on that now because, um, yes, for 28 years I've been on the back of a, a TV broadcasting motorcycle, but Sunday, of course, I ran oh, through yeah. those streets for the first yeah, time. that's right. And it was really, really exciting to, um, you know, to watch the incredible development of this sport. I mean, that's what we're going to be talking about. Mm-hmm. But, um, but to, to be a part of it. You know, all those years I did broadcasting, um, 
I thought that my marathoning career was entirely over. Um, uh, I was certainly not my running career, but my marathoning career. And and I'd finish the broadcast, and I would uh, be glad with the broadcast. I'd be glad with my interview, and I'd come back at home, and then I would be flat as a pancake because everybody else was walking around the city wearing their medals and on this <laughs> endorphin high. And I, I said, you know, after Boston this year, which I ran for my 50th anniversary, I was in pretty good shape and ran better than I ever imagined. And I said, you know, this is the year to do it. If if I don't do it now, you never know. So I've checked that one off. It was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, you awesome. know, there were there were 50,000 people in the race, and there must have been a million and a half watching. It was yeah. unbelievable. Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. We were we good were, to the TV. We watching, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And what's really neat is you have such a legacy that most people don't even realize. And, like, when you were had that luncheon and you were talking about the Avon run and I was reading through that book, I was like – that was actually the first uh, 5K that I did with my mom was the one that you had in Kansas City, your Avon race. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And did that, get you on the, did that get you on the road to being a runner? Yeah, and just like the camaraderie that comes with that. Everybody's cheering each other on. And, you know, we talk about women tend to tear each other down, but there's certain, especially things like sports that bring us together and bring the mm-hmm. best of us out. Well, interestingly enough... Um, Running is really unique that way. Sports, of course, in general, but sometimes when you have to be competitive and you need to go after your opponent, your your mindset is completely different from the relaxed state it's in when you're all running a marathon together. And, you know, we recently had this very, very sad and upsetting um, terrorist attack in mm-hmm. New York right before the New York City Marathon. And everybody was saying, oh, isn't, you know, that is such a terrible thing. It's going to wreck the marathon. And, and in fact, what happens is, is it brought the marathoners closer together and it brought us closer to the people of the city. And the New York Police Department and the New York Roadrunners were amazing about it. And what we see all the time is that running is a universal language and it breaks down barriers of communication and it allows us to meet each other on a different joyful level we may not actually even speak the same language, but we know that we believe in each other. I, I was just saying last night, I was doing a panel with the great Meb Kofleski. Yeah, you know, this I saw was that. his last <clears throat> great race. Um, and I said, you know, in a marathon, I could turn to the person to the right of me and then the person to the left of me and not even know who they are. And I would trust them with my life. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's what a marathon does. You just. You just know that nobody would be there if they weren't a wonderful person. Mm-hmm. Very true. <laughs> and maybe it might be a Pollyanna thing, but I think it could go a long way <laughs> to helping world peace. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, that kind of brings me to my first question. You know, you said that you weren't necessarily going out to make history or make a point when you entered the race. You just loved running and wanted to be able to run in it. What do you think of the involvement of women's sports now? Oh, I, I mean, it's night and day. Um, what's what's happened? I uh, first of all, I always just love going out and running and and not having to think about politics or or pushing ahead and just just relaxing and let the the run be the you know the, the gift from the heavens that it is, which is stress relief, creativity, joy, nature, all of those things. But the evolution that has happened from from for women's running is is nothing so less than a social revolution. You know, there there are more women runners in the United States now than there there are male runners, and that's because they feel so empowered and accomplished in ways they've never felt before. And that go, that goes such a long way in terms of um, you know creating a very bright future for women because so many women are afraid or timid to take the first step to step out of their fear box. You know, they stay in bad relationships. They stay in a bad job. They don't pursue a good education for because they're afraid that they'll fail or they're afraid of the unknown. And running allows us to take the next big step. And we all know what it was like to run our first mile. And then we say, well, maybe I can run that 5K. And then after that, we say, well, maybe I can run 10K. Mm-hmm. And pretty soon, they, the, pretty soon you run a marathon, you can do anything. Yeah, and it, which is true. If you, can run, if you can run a marathon, you say, whoa, what am I, why am I limiting myself? Mm-hmm. And I think it's great that this happens at any age. I'm seeing many women, 65, 70, 75, right. 80, only beginning to run. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like they're grabbing back a part of their life that they didn't think they could could ever have or get back and they are and it's really amazing so i just i just thought on sunday just like i did at boston in april that the the streets 
are completely changed. The scene is completely changed. We have no sense of limitation. And now the bigger, bigger thing we have to do now is to get this out to other women in the world, many of whom have, most of whom actually, have no opportunities or, mm-hmm. or no sense of fearlessness whatsoever. I mean, they're terrified. Mm-hmm. So most of the women in the world are, are, are in that situation. And, and, you know, we think, oh, well, she's in Afghanistan, but that may not be true. She might be living next door to you. So. Mm-hmm. That's that's what two six one fearless is all about. We'll get to talking about that in a minute. I know. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. Talking a little bit more about two six one. So on the flip side, you know, this running is really great at empowering, but yet it seems like female athletes are still trying to buy into societal norms. So I treat a lot of female athletes with eating disorders or disordered eating, and the th- I've used your book and pulled out some of the bits like. You talked about how every night you would drink chocolate milk and eat peanut butter and jellies to help keep your period or something along that line and how it was normal for the ladies before race to wear tights to prevent chafing and they would keep tampons with them in case their period started. What do you think now this involvement of we must be as thin as possible and, you know, put performance before your health? Oh, I actually think that has changed completely. Um, Honestly, it used to be um, a really kind of frightening thing after Title IX when women got track scholarships. Um, The coaches and the women themselves went through really, really bad um, experiences, very, very frequently with problems with anorexia, eating disorders, because the women knew that if they could be thin, they could run faster. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's for a very, very limited period of time. And um, now I'm seeing these women, honestly, they look healthier, bigger, have a layer of fat that I've never, ever seen before in sports, and it's really a wonderful thing to see. Here's another wonderful example. Uh, on Sunday, I ran with, not, not step and step, but we were on the, on the same team, essentially, with Carly Kloss, the great fashion model, the supermodel, mm-hmm. um, who is six feet tall. I mean, I thought I was pretty tall. You know, I look <laughs> taller than I am. But boy, next to her, she dwarfed me. And it was great putting, putting my arm around her for pictures because you could, you could feel on, on her waist and her hips, you know, a layer of fat which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was a very, very healthy image of of blooming health. So uh, several things on this have changed. Um, First of all, um, I notice now at the uh, intercollegiate level that that the women do not have as many anorexic problems as they used to, and they are going on from collegiate careers to have very good road careers. In and that didn't happen before because they would usually be so completely burned out at the end of their collegiate career. Um, they didn't have many opportunities to go on, but they also weren't well um, and often had stress fractures. Now um, I'm seeing, for instance, I think we had four Americans in the top ten in the New York City Marathon mm-hmm. on Sunday. That's huge. That's awesome. That's huge. That's never happened before. And they're very healthy-looking ladies. Yes, um, I will say that. Um, as for me, um, n- I never had a problem losing my period. Uh, the reason I had the peanut butter and the chocolate milk every night was when I was a young girl, I was trying to hustle my puberty along. I was like 13 <laughs> or 14, and I was desperate to be a young woman. And, and all around me in high school, all these, these other girls, had, you know, they'd reached puberty and I hadn't. And I wanted to gain weight. I was a very skinny kid. And like, you know, but, but perfectly normal, just, just a skinny kid. So I would eat peanut butter and uh, chocolate milk every night to gain weight. And one, one year I gained 15 pounds and grew about five inches and boom, suddenly there I was, you know, started the, started, (laughs) started the year as a a little girl and wound up as a young lady. So Mm -hmm. it was amazing. But yeah, um, that's not to diminish the fact that there aren't um, problems with anorexia, I don't think they are as directly related to sports as they used to be, however. Okay. And, um, but it is, it is a, a, a problem with a lot of women, and it has to do with the lack of control that they feel in their lives. 
And that's why I'm, th- you know, another thing that we love about 261. 261, as a, a nonprofit and a, and a group, is both a movement and a group of non judgmental women. It's not about competing, it's not about getting faster. It's about a non judgmental community of women who talk to each other and communicate and sort of share the secrets of their soul. And they do that through running and jogging and walking. We don't make them run fast at all. And this goes a long way to feeling um, like there's no pressure on them. You know, when when you feel pressure and you try to control it, sometimes it comes out in other abnormal ways like anorexia. So Mm -hmm. those are the the issues we have to deal with. Somebody good you should talk to. um, There's a whole division of anorexia at Children's Hospital in Boston, Mm -hmm. and they have a whole special division of of eating disorders and and also the women athletes who are are there, the gymnasts, the runners, the ballet dancers who have have an issue. It's interesting. Well, ironic that you'd say that because we interviewed Dr. Ackerman today, too. Oh, great. Well, there we go. She's terrific, She's phenomenal, she? yeah. She is great. We missed you at the Female Athlete Conference. I didn't make it the year that you were there, so I was disappointed. It's a great conference. Mm-hmm. I hope to come back. It was, it was terrific. Well, we hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Catherine, uh-huh. this when I've been watching or listening to interviews that you that you have done, what I hear when you talk about running is just this pure joy and love for the sport. Um, and you've touched on this a little bit, but how do you think it served and empowered you? And how do you think it serves and empowers women in general? Well, you know, I don't know what the chemical reasons are, and surely there must be chemical reasons. But um, honestly, everybody says, you know. Um, uh, I go out for a run in a bad mood, and I come back in a good mood. Mm-hmm. Now, so something's happening with with either oxygen over the over the brain, or uh, you know, endorphins, um, or whatever the opiate release is from the brain. You know, uh, doctors will often tell you that that they treat depressives uh, sometimes with jogging and sometimes with drugs, and they come out about the same. Mm-hmm. So the the interesting thing about the the running part of it is is that at the end of the day. They are not um, dependent on a pill. They feel accomplished in something they've done. And I think that's one of the biggest things about your mental health is that no matter how crappy a day is, when you go out and run, you come back and you say, I've done that for myself. It's another brick in the wall. I feel good. Even 10 minutes makes you feel that way. And it's it's the, the empowerment Um, of doing something by yourself in the sense of your own power, capability, and fearlessness. And that transfers into all areas of your life. I mean, you could could tell, as well as I could, hundreds of stories about women who started running and then got a better job or got an education or whatever. And... um, or we're better mothers and better role models for the kids mm-hmm. and a lot healthier. So, so yeah, those, those are the things. Um, but for me, honestly, this is a really good kind of mental health story is that, you know, I've run all my life. Um, and there were times when I dreaded going out, but that's when I was highly competitive and I had to get, let's say 2400s in on a cold night alone on a track. That's really a gloomy prospect. Having finished such a workout though, I always said, okay, great. You know, you can really do the, do amazing things. But then I would always say, gosh, I got to get up tomorrow morning and and go out again (laughs) because I was doing two workouts a day. It just seemed relentless. Mm -hmm. Now running breaks stress of a different kind. It's the stress of, uh, of work, broadcasting, organizing, writing, of of starting a global nonprofit, and when the the minute I say I don't have time to go out and run, I say I'd better get that run, and else I'm going to explode. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing that busts the stress and gives me a perspective. So, um, I just I just see so many women, you know, who are. You know, they can't fit it all in, so they slip out of bed at 4 o'clock in the morning, get out there and get 20 minutes in so they can get back, get a shower, and get the kids out of bed and get Mm -hmm. them off to school and get to work, you know? And it means that much to them. Absolutely. My husband knows that I'm definitely a better wife and mother if I get my run in, so he allows that for sure. Um, Well, Catherine, tell us more about 261 Fearless, how it came about, and how we can get involved in um, the organization. I'd love everybody listening to get involved in the organization. You know, as I say, we're non-judgmental and we welcome all of you. Uh, the best thing, first of all, to do is go to 261fearless.org um, and click on any of the click-ons. Um, for instance, if you're interested in running the Boston Marathon in 2018, we still have a few charity bibs left, I think. 
So if you're listening to this broadcast, you better hit it quickly. <laughs> they're going, they're going like fast, but fast. But also about how to start a club, about how to be a, a, a supporter, how to be a friend, how to communicate with other women. There are all kinds of really different things. But here's the bottom line: it began organically, totally, when people picked up the the picture of me being attacked in the Boston Marathon and the race director trying to rip off my bib number two six one, and he he missed it because my boyfriend decked him, th- sent him out of the race instead. I went on to finish, but people started picking up on the bib number as a symbol and a magic number meaning fearless in the face of adversity. Mm-hmm. So um, it began organically. We decided we would create a nonprofit organization out of it. Now we have a network of community clubs around the world and a powerful communications network through a website, which is going to go multilingual, I hope, later this year, and we uh, are intent on giving women, here's the bottom line, intent on giving women an empowering experience through running or walking by putting one foot in front of the other. Mm. And the best way to do this is a direct touch with a community club. So we are training club leaders now and master coaches, and we would welcome you to start a club, take the course so that you know how to do that, and help women in your community just to come out once a week, put all the other you know, crap of their life behind them, <laughs> come together as a group um, for at whatever level, and we will have fun. We're gonna ha- we're gonna play a little, and we're gonna make you feel really good at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Good and to me. that's it's pretty simple, but it works. Um, being not ju- non-judgmental is not simple, though. I mean, there are many many women who are nervous about supporting other women who are suspicious, um, who are competitive or they're protective and defensive. So we need to make sure that, you know, we're really, really very open-minded mm-hmm. about everything. And, and that's that's the important aspect, so that people feel safe and healthy. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're going to do it. We're doing it like crazy. And, and it's very popular and the concept is working. So I'd love you guys to join us. Yeah, we would love to. Well, what a good timing of this organization. Beck and I were just talking today about kind of what a crazy time we live in in terms of um, issues coming out and issues that women struggle with. So, again, what a good time for this organization to be available to women. Exactly. And it's a really good and important time to feel fearless. And sometimes mm-hmm. when you feel fearless or you want to feel fearless, you feel like you're alone out there. Mm-hmm. And with 261 Fearless, you're not alone out there. Mm-hmm. And that's a great feeling. And you're right. I mean, this is the craziest period politically uh, I, have, I have ever lived through. Mm-hmm. Um, and and um, having fought all my life for women's rights, um, to see that we are in danger of, of losing a lot of our very basic elemental rights. Um, fortunately, I think women um, are waking up and, and, and saying, okay, sorry, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to go out there and, and protect me and my family. And, and the signs along the, the marathon route yesterday were quite revealing about that <laughs> because, you know, half the field was women yesterday. Mm-hmm. I mean, on Sunday running the New York City Marathon. Mm-hmm. So you can bet your, you can bet your boopy that, that <laughs> half of the, half of the spectators were women too. Oh, um, so yeah, yeah, that it, it is an important time. Mm-hmm. It is an important time to, um, pick up an injustice and make it right, mm-hmm. you know, and to somebody an opportunity, you know, and I think that's the biggest thing is to give somebody an opportunity to be fearless. Absolutely. An important time to be fearless and uh, empower other women. So Catherine, we appreciate you being on. We like to end every interview with our interviewees telling us a little bit about how they live the fit philosophy. So how do you um, continue to increase performance, focus on your health, intellect, and taking time for self? So how, with all the things you've got going on, Mm -hmm. find the balance in your life? You know, um, sometimes I feel like a fraud when I answer this question (laughs) because, because, you know, I don't think my life is very well balanced. I mean, my house is a mess. If you came to my house, you would say a hoarder lived here because, you know, I'm never here. I travel and I, it's piles of stuff. Um, uh, and I sort of squeeze in my workouts and things. But this is the point. The point is, is that running always makes me better for doing it than not doing it. Mm-hmm. It makes me feel better. It makes me happier. 
and it is my north not only my north star but it is it is the thing i think that has given me my health all my life I'm 70 years old, and I just ran the New York City Marathon. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I haven't run the New York City Marathon in 42 years. So come on. It's never too late to get it back, um, but you need to keep up with it. And therefore, I regard my running every day as a gift to me, a very, very important gift to me that makes me better also for everybody else. And then I just adopt that attitude and I just go and do it. And I am so happy as soon as I start putting one foot in front of the other. So that's my philosophy. It, I can't tell you that I have a scheduled time of day. I do not. It's kind of when I think I can fit it in. But one gift I do try to give myself now that I never had when I was a, you know, um, a working wife with, um, you know, obligations and, and, and corporate jobs and commutes, um, I always had to train in the dark. This time I train in sunlight. Mm-hmm. And that is that is the gift I've given myself. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's amazing, Catherine. Thanks so much for the work you've done in the field of women's sports, and um, congratulations on uh, the New York City Marathon. And thank you so much for joining us today. You're so welcome, and I wish everybody out there good health. And don't put off good health; you deserve to be good. Oh, Absolutely. That's right. Thanks thank so much, you, Catherine. Catherine. Thank you guys so much. Mm-hmm. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you to our sponsor today, Sentimano Counseling. Sentimano Counseling is the premier perinatal mental health practice in Kansas City, treating mood disorders during pregnancy and postpartum, perinatal loss, infertility, eating, and exercise disorders. Go to sentimano.com for further information about the practice and services. For additional information on today's topic and guests, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Fit for a Queen. And Hashtag don't. Fit for a Queen. And don't forget to rate us on iTunes. We can't wait for you to join us next time on Fit for a Queen. Bye, Queens.